Okay, we know that the core elements of um, good governance usually would include transparency, integrity, accountability, responsiveness, you know, absence of corruption as mm -hmm. well. And from all of these indicators, I mean, we don't need to say so much about what's happening in Nigeria to define mm -hmm. if we're actually experiencing bad governance or good mm -hmm. governance. But then I'm, I'm happy that we have um, Mr. Deli Farutimi with us here today to discuss. And we know that he's a man of many words. And mm -hmm. we definitely cannot wait to hear from him as well. So... Yes, I would love to hear from you. What's your, what, what's your take on this, sir? How do you think you know, this? It's pretty interesting. I saw some infographic run through your screen just then, and I saw that at the base of good governance, mm. you've got a good justice system, and then you've got a rule of law. You know, when we drop all these precepts and concepts in Nigeria, we talk about them as though there is a standard for the whole world and another standard for we Nigerians. So and this simply cannot be. We must understand that each and every one of these are global concepts. Democracy is global in nature. Good governance, each and every one of them are global concepts. So when we talk about building a sustainable governance structure, we must understand very quickly that we can't wish this into existence. We have to consciously work towards the establishment of a society where we can actually have a sustainable governance structure. But how do we do this? Citizens build states. Yeah. But our country is a very interesting place. It is a country that has refused to evolve citizenship. And even when, when I say this, you look to your passports and you begin to wonder what that mad lawyer is saying. But beyond the semantics, when you go to the root of the issue, you'll find very quickly that whilst you are members of the Nigerian state, you are not citizens. You cannot have citizenship in a place that is not ruled by law. Mm. When you do not have equality of persons who live in a particular space, then you cannot call the people living in that space citizens. Mm -hmm. And you also cannot build a sustainable society in the absence of the rule of law. Because you cannot have justice in a place that is equally unruled by law. So everything goes back to the very basis of the existence of any state. I think it's the French philosopher, I believe it was Montesquieu, who spoke about the social compact theory. The general thinking in Europe is that the state came into being as a function of the readiness of citizens to give up their rights in order to build an overarching hegemon that now takes care of everybody, protects their interests. That is the very first of its duties, the protection of the interest. And then as that society evolved, they came to the point where you had stuff like the Magna Carta which sought to curtail the powers of kings and potentates to the point where they evoked the concept of citizenship. Even the Christian ideology itself is found on the equality of persons. All this suggests that you must have the law ruling that is stronger than the strongest person in the society and thus guarantees the right of everybody. Yeah. Unfortunately, Nigeria is not a place ruled by law. In the absence of law, we have been ruled by impunity. So it becomes impossible to have a society that is sustainable because our society is not governed by law. So I'm sorry, even the Labour Party or Mr. Peter Gregory Rubin, however well-intentioned they might be, in the absence of a decision by the Nigerian collective to build a society that is governed by law, not by strong men who begins to dictate to everyone else, not governed by magicians in the guise of Supreme Court justices who impose their own will in the place of law. That is not a place that you can build sustainably. We, as a collective, must come to the understanding that we cannot build that society if we do not build one that is anchored to the rule of law. Without the rule of law, you can't have justice. Without justice, 
You can't have equality. Without equality, you cannot have citizenship. And that is why we have a mess that needs serious fixing in five days' time, beginning in five days' time. But right now, we do not have anything to speak of. We can only begin to imagine and hope that we, having discovered ourselves and installed the government that we desire, yeah. will then begin the journey to rectitude, to building a country that will be ruled by law, where everybody can be sure that they will find justice, whether they are rich or poor, high or low. That is the only way you can build a sustainable society. Sorry, can I come in? Okay. Um, yeah. I would like to ask a question because now, with what you said, it's a bit scary. Um, it's a bit scary in the sense that what you have just said, if the polls come, because we know that the polls is coming, 20, 25th of February, we will go to the polls to decide who we will elect as our, um, our president and, of course, the National Assembly. Now, tell me this. If you say that there is no rule of law, what then gives that whatever it is that the decisions of the of the majority of Nigerians, if this decision maybe tilts towards what the majority wants, which is the youth, and then eventually that is not what the controllers, this um, um, what's it called? What do you call them now? The, the owners of Nigeria. The owners of Nigeria. It's not what they want. So what then guarantees? And this will stand. What guarantees that? Because now you are you are even making me a lot more scared. I thought I had hope with my PVC, but now what what you're saying is just almost like negating everything. Oh, uh, I am not a prophet of doom, <laughs> but I speak the truth as I see it. It is for my hearers to determine whether what I have said resonates with what they know mm. in their own spirit or if I have merely spoken, enjoying the sound of my own voice, why it's been backwards and cacophonous. Here is the thing. You don't need me to tell you that Nigeria is not governed by law. You are the ones who have willfully hypnotized yourselves into believing the lie that you know to be the lies. A country ruled by law would not have space for the massacre superintended by the Nigerian army. I'm not even talking to the one at Lekki Gate yet. I'm talking to the one superintended by Buratai's guards. Mm. Specifically, I think that was in, uh, was, that, was that Kaduna or Zaria? I'm not sure exactly where now. In the north, the Shia were having their procession. I believe it was 430 of them that were pronounced murdered by the judicial panel of inquiry set up by the Kaduna state government. Wrap your brains around that. In their own country, because they were proceeding and they blocked the road, they were summarily executed, and nobody, not one person, has been held responsible for their death until today. 430 of them. Citizens do not get killed like that. But that was in far away northern Nigeria in Kaduna State. Right there at Lekki Toll Gate, the whole world knew exactly what happened. We might all continue to pretend that we do not know, but the panel itself returned its verdict. There is a company known as LCC. It was complicit in that multiple murders. Nothing has happened to it till date. The Nigerian army, paid for by Nigerian citizens, has not been held responsible till date, in spite of the clear indictment. There is a governor sitting in this state. Till date, he's still denying it, in spite of the fact that over 100, no, 100 million, to be specific, into tranches of 50, 50 million, had been paid in cash to those who lost lives, families of those who lost lives, and limbs in that place. So when we talk about the lawlessness of Nigeria, these are practical, demonstrable, easily provable facts. What now happens as a function of our realization of the putrefaction of our society and the readiness to walk away from it is another ball game entirely. But we need to tell ourselves these basic truths. We are not a society ruled by law. We are a society where impunity is administered. It's been like that forever. Buhari didn't start it. He didn't start with Jonathan either, 
I would even go as far as to say that it preceded Obasanjo's coming in 1999. Nigeria has always been ruled by impunity. The only thing is that for a change, we have a chance. 30 years after the first time we had a chance, now we have another one. But we must be deliberate and intentional about fighting what is in front of us. We need to understand that we can't continue like this. Our country is not ruled by law. We can pretend all we want. Our reality does not suggest that we are ruled by law. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank right, you. okay, so um, I like the fact that you talked about um, the rule of law and, you know, everything around it, because word on the street has it that um, Nigerians should be, like, Nigerians should be governed as though you're governing, like you're, you're establishing a business, you know, having a human resource manager. And we talked a bit about that yeah. in the makeup yeah, room. And, uh, you know, a, a place where um, every election, every appointment is strictly based on competence. And this perhaps is the reason why majority of people out there are, you know, opting for one of the candidates that has a track record of, you know, successful uh, business management. What do you have to say about that? Um, for a long time, the ruiners of Nigeria got away with running riot because we refused to own Nigeria. We just abandoned Nigeria to the rulers of Nigeria. So they ran riot all over the place, but I guess the coming of Buhari has opened everybody's eyes to the fact that elections have consequences. Uh, the, the, the ruination that we've all witnessed and been victims of to varying degrees over the last seven and a half years has reconnected the people to their PVC, to the electoral process. A lot of people sacrifice their time and their resources to also work to bring us to where we are today. But the important thing is this. Nigerians are realizing that we cannot leave governance to the worst of us. And we cannot continue to believe that we can somehow continue to subsidize governmental inefficiency. So everybody, you know when they say breakfast, we will go round. <laughs> everybody has been well served. I think at this point, the largest victims, the largest pool of victims, the largest demography are the young ones who are having to vote with their feet and run out of Nigeria, but so many of them have run away. The tales coming out of Jakba is not sounding so palatable. Sure. Less and less of them are interested in going anywhere. And they are realizing that maybe if we all took a stand this time around and just fight for Nigeria instead of leaving it for them to keep doing as they like with it. If you say it has no value to you, they will continue to abuse it. So we are all beginning to realize that we actually have nowhere else to go. Mm. And we just have to fix this place. So yeah, a lot of us are now looking at it. If I'm not going to hire a man to run my poultry, why would I hire him to run my country? Mm. I'm a Yoruba man. The first question you ask when you're going to, when you meet someone new, or when they meet you, when I was younger, they say, who is your father? Uh, so where is your home? Or in typical Yoruba parlance, Agbole Politijade, that means where is, what, what, what homestead are you from? They want to determine your provenance. Who are you? I think we're getting to that point in our political history now, where people are now becoming interested in the provenance of the characters who are looking to run for office. So I think 2023 really is more of a reflection on our own capacities for deductive and inductive logic, and perhaps it will also tell how much we have learned from our experiences of, or if we are doomed as Sisyphus to continue to roll this stone up the hill forever without achieving anything, because it doesn't make sense. If we haven't learned by now, we can never learn. Thank you very much, Adiola. Okay, so I, I mean, I like, again, I like the fact that it's the rule of law, but I want to take the focus a bit away from, I mean, um, the expectations that we all have that, I mean, some form of magic is going to happen when we elect a new, you know, government. So I want to ask, I mean, true governance is it's a dual responsibility, the responsibility of the government and then the citizenry. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think, sir, is the steps or are the steps that we need to take 
as citizens to be beneficiaries of not just the rule of law, but an effective, you know, um, um, society where um, was a sustainable yeah, governance is yeah. achievable? Yeah. Good. First thing first. The first thing you need to do, understand that in your current state, you are not a citizen. Mm. <laughs> your citizenship is an aspiration. Wow. It is only when you understand wow. it to be an aspiration, something you want, you desire it. Only citizens hold rulers to account. Mm. Only citizens are protected by law. A policeman will not point a gun at the citizen and declare blightly, I'll kill you and nothing will happen. Mm. See, the policeman in a society where there are citizens would not say that. Mm. It is only in a society where the police does not consider that. Let, let's even break that down a little. Who, who is the policeman? The person whose job it is to enforce okay. and uphold the law. When you now have a situation where it is the person whose duty it is by law to protect okay. you, to uphold the law, that is telling you, and this is commonplace in Nigeria, mm. I will kill you mm. and nothing, nothing will happen. happen. What the person is telling you is that he is affirming the reign of impunity over law. Mm. So first of all, understand that you are not a citizen. Your declaration of citizenship is at best an aspiration, a worthy one to have, and I'm aspiring to one myself. Mm. But unlike you, I have not embraced the illusion of a citizenship that I know I do not possess. So now, if you are now desirous of citizenship, mm. you will now need to move beyond all of those things that have limited your capacity to become citizens. What are those things? The things that divide us as Nigerians. Mm. Because it is in our division that those who ruin this country have found validation for their powers. So, religion is the first of those things. You must vote in the coming elections forgetting religion. Even though the APC has sought to make religion an issue in its choice of candidate, we must take our decision looking beyond religion. Secondly, we must look beyond ethnicity. I say this understanding that the basis of Nigerian nationality is actually the ethnic group, not the person. Because if we have citizenship, we would engage Nigeria as citizens. But we are unable to engage Nigeria as citizens because Nigeria has not allowed the law to rule. So we generally engage Nigerian I and mean, the Yoruba man is the turn of the Yoruba, which is what started the idiocy of a Milokon. Oh, oh, no, I'm an Igbo man. Or oh, I'm, a, I'm a Fulani man. I'm an Ijo man. We are really anything. We are, we are always everything but Nigerian because Nigeria has not allowed to for a common identity for those who should be called Nigerians. Yeah. So first thing first, understand the aspirational nature of citizenship in Nigeria and then vote understanding that it is your city, it is your vote that might, if enough of us should have the sufficient brain to vote right, we might then become citizens. If we don't become citizens, we would have at least Galvanize sufficient numbers of us to continue making that demand of the Nigerian state. However, when we have now won the right to be citizens, it doesn't end there. If anything, that is when the battle begins. There are 77 trillions in debt amassed by this administration waiting for whoever is coming next. Those are not abstracts. Those are real figures. And the fact that they have done a fantastic job of popularizing everyone, they've taken away all of the cash. All of us are now dependent on the banking system. It means that you can't hide your money. Mm. They have to increase the tax rate. They have to widen the tax ban. Mm. So you will be paying taxes, whether you are paying to those who will use the money productively or those who will use the money to further impoverish you. Elections have consequences. Whether these people will cut cost where it should be cut, or whether they will be asking us to tighten our own belts while their own babies are sleeping over their trousers, those will be the decisions to be taken. That is when your citizenship becomes an issue. 
whether the state, whether the federal government and the state government, the rulers generally would continue their ruinous policies of borrowing to consume, while demanding that the rest of us continue to bleed our substance to keep them in style. These are the things that will determine the content of our citizenship. I would prefer to be marching on the street with an obi presidency in place. I wouldn't want to be marching on the street with a man who has already asked, what were they doing there? Those who were killed, what were they doing there? That is excusing murder and massacre. I'm not going to be marching on the street for somebody who has no problem deleting a tweet condemning religious murder. So as far as I'm concerned, my preferences are clear. Yeah. But this coming election and the aftermath are going to be consequential for Nigeria and Nigerians. And whilst Nigeria might deserve some of the evil looming over it, Nigerians certainly do not deserve this evil. And I urge all of us, <laughs> arm yourselves with your PVC. Yeah. It doesn't end with even a victory for our preferred candidate, just speaking for myself. Mm. It doesn't end there, it only begins there, yeah. because there are people whose interests are better guaranteed by keeping us the way we are. And if he is going to succeed, if he ever gets there, it will be because we stood behind him and have refused to walk away and have insisted on him keeping his word and making sure that those who are the gatekeepers of power, the National Assembly, the governors do the right thing, even when we have done our part. Mm. Well said, sir. Well said, sir. I, I like what he said about saying that even after you vote, that yeah. is just the, the beginning. beginning. I mean, go on listening to Mr. Dilip Farah. <laughs> Steady giving us the glasses. <laughs> but then there's so much more to this conversation. Mm. We'll see you right after the break. If you're just tuned in, we're discussing the topic building a sustainable governance structure with Dele Faratimi. Remember, you can join the conversation, send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-803-84663. You could also tweet at us at WayShowAfrica1 with the hashtag WayShow. Okay, so um, Mr. Faratimi was saying that um, it doesn't stop at you going to cast your votes. I mean, that's mm -hmm. only just the beginning. The beginning. The he also step. spoke about how, you know, the rule of law. And he spoke about how we are not citizens. <laughs> we should have said. That was a shocker. <laughs> Honestly. Was, but then he made such a fantastic yeah, point. Yeah, argument for it. You're yeah. only protected when you're a citizen. True. If you're a true citizen, nobody would say, uh, 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 somebody in the executive office would yeah. not say, I yeah. will shoot you and you can do mm, nothing about yeah. it. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, after after saying all of this, uh, I, would, I would like to ask, I mean, we've, just, we've spoken about what um, the indicators of good governance are, like rule of law, accountability, yeah. integrity, yeah. and all of that. And then knowing that you're, you are a spokesperson for the Southwest region of Labour Party, I would like to ask, how is your party intending to actually improve or build a sustainable structure of governance following all of these indicators that we've spoken about? Well, um, don't worry, Chinelo. Don't get despondent. Because I know that sometimes when we look at the bleakness of our reality, mm. it becomes very easy to despair. But it is not my intention to depress anyone or give you cause to worry. Mm. Let me say that. Our situation is not irredeemable. And um, whilst I speak for the Obidati campaign, I am not a member of the Labour Party. I am a member of Afeni Ferry, which is part and parcel of the OB campaign. But it is our own belief that the Labour Party of today is akin to the Nadeco platform of the 90s, which was formed essentially to get rid of the military. The Labour Party of today is one where each and every one of us who believe that Nigeria deserves to be rescued and that Nigerians deserve to have a home that they can be proud of, we all coalesce together and came behind the candidacy of Mr. Peter Gregory Obi. And um, it is our firm belief that whilst many things are wrong with Nigeria, 
the most important of them in my own view being our constitution. I am also of the firm opinion that without the right leadership in place, who understands, we might disagree on policy and ideology, but we can agree that where we are is not where we should be. And we can also agree on where we should be heading. So you find a whole lot of us working for Mr. Peter B and Mr. Dati's ticket in the understanding that this is an epochal moment in Nigeria's history. We're at an inflection point. We are not looking to ideology. We're just looking at, one, the need for the drastic change required by Nigeria. Second, the need to have honest, purposeful leadership. Now, if we have honest, purposeful leadership, we might begin to have disagreements that are based on the pathways to achievement of strategic goals. But it will not be because we are busy chasing ephemeral things that are not important to the people, which is what has happened to Nigeria for the last few decades. It didn't start with Buhari. Reality is that we've been on a long journey to nowhere because we've lost focus. We have worked without purpose. So it is our belief that Mr. Peter Obi's presidency would offer the necessary leadership and the sense of purpose that should anchor us so that we can constrain our resources. We are not poor people. The tragedy of Nigeria is best seen if you will visit IITA in Ibadan. Once you drive into IITA, you could be anywhere in the world. Beautiful place. It could be paradise. But the moment you come back outside, you're back in the hell. So within our own land, paradise was built by those to whom we leased land. But we who own the land, we continue to live in hell. So this is essentially about the complete lack of leadership. Yes, Peter Obi can do it on his own. And I've said this ad nauseum. But at least we start somewhere. So that's what this is about. It's about starting somewhere. Okay, all right. Um, I think Uwa has a question. Uwa. Okay, so I was just going to ask, um, please, uh, Mr. Paris, whilst we're talking, um, you talked about the how our um, we're being pushed against religious lines, you know, division against um, tribal lines and religion. You cannot take away the fact that your principal, Peter B, largely has huge support. You know, he's also a beneficiary from this religious. Um, uh, what's it called, division or whatever religious line, because a lot of churches are fully, you know, backing his candidacy. You know, so I, the, the reason I'm throwing this is because, again, whether we like it or not, this particular election will still ride on those religion and tribal lines, right? So how do we move past those kinds of things for, like, future reference? And speaking to the governorship, I mean, sorry, to governors that would work hand in hand, we are seeing what is happening Currently, with um, El Rufai, uh, what's his name, even Son Wolu and um, uh, Dapa Biodo, ordering their state um, citizens to to go against, you know, the 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 overruling of the Supreme Court. In fact, there's a lot of mess going on there by the presidency, right? And state governors are saying, no, go back to using the old currency. There's just too many messiness, you know. There is no level of coordination. So, if someone like a Peter comes into power becomes president, right? Are we not seeing catastrophe happening? Because that is one of the, uh, what's it called, the language that APC is saying that we, they might see some level of stability since they have majority, for instance, in the Senate and in the House of Rep uh, um, Representatives. So I'm, I'm trying to just squeeze in all my questions all at once, but I think you get where I'm going. Um, let me start with Peter Obi and the religious, the religious politics of Nigeria. I wrote a book published about two years ago now. I believe that was the imperatives of the Nigerian revolution. And there is an entire section on the role of Nigeria, uh, or the role of religion in Nigerian politics. I am not blind to what religion has done to us as a race. And I am not blind to what religion has done to us as a country. But I will say that in this particular election cycle, it is the APC and its presidential ticket that has elevated religion into an issue 
in its own right in this election. Ordinarily, religion is usually something that is used in whispers during elections in Nigeria. And ordinarily, it is one part, it is usually, it is both religion that have been quite adept at politicizing their interest and offering their support to adherents of their faith. But in this particular election cycle, a particular presidential candidate looked to the entire northern part of the country and saw no reason why he must balance the ticket when it comes to religion. So you had a Muslim, Muslim ticket from the governing party in a season when a lot of religious upheavals have taken place in the country. So they made religion an issue. Mr. Peter Obi's religion is not something that started yesterday and his religiosity, or if he, if he is in any way, shape or form declared to be religious, is not something he acquired as a function of his ambition. His older brother is a priest. The older sister is a nun. I am very sure that if the man had been able to deal with his carnality, he probably would have ended up a Catholic <laughs> priest himself. But I am sure the beautiful woman he married has ensured that we at least have the opportunity to have a man who fears God and who is interested in the year after, interested in governing our country. So when it comes to religion, blame that not on Peter Obi. That is the exclusive preserve, particularly of the APC, which made religion an issue. Mr. Peter Obi has not visited churches more than he usually do. It's not now that he started visiting churches. It's not now that he started giving. And that he has visited churches has not stopped him from visiting IDP camps. That is his own way of life. That's his own choice. Now, when it comes to the governor and the way they have been acting, running riot all over the place, I need you to understand the desperation is real. Over a trillion naira remains outside of the banking system. I'm no economist, but I dare say that the bulk of that money has passed all over the country, waiting to be deployed in the services of the power demons next style day, this five days from now. But if this is the only thing Buhari will do right in eight years, I don't know what motives he might have, but I know that it will have the effect of reducing the effect of, my, of Naira in this election. I don't know what his own motives are. We might just be collateral beneficiary of his own wickedness. So be it. The important thing is that on this election day that is coming in five days' time, Money will not be a factor. Bullion vans are not going to be entering anybody's houses. Whether they trade there, like uh, stray dogs, whether they went there to drop companies' cash for salary for any company, it doesn't matter. Bullion vans have been outlawed. And even if they are not outlawed, how many bullion vans can you deploy at this point in time? So when you see the governors running riot, understand that almost all of them have warehouses full of money that have now expired. That is one. Second thing is that they are dealing with a lame duck president. Buari is at best a lame duck. What can he do to anybody at this point? The judiciary is hopelessly compromised. Even if he sets the EFCC or anybody after them, they will purchase a judiciary, they will, they will procure a judicial pronouncement and free themselves of him until he leaves. So they can treat him with the contents by which they are dealing with him now because they know that they are all the same. All this one that is doing last minute Shakara is just last minute Shakara. But to now, to now relate this specifically to my own principal in the race, Peter Obi was Afghan governor in a state where all the legislative, uh, the House of Assembly members were PDP. Yes, they impeached him, but because he was doing the will of the people and he stayed on the right side of the law, he was reinstated. And he stayed an Abga governor for eight years. And he ruled the state, and the people were behind him. Let me be clear. We are about to go into an election. 
the people will decide who goes to the houses of reps and who goes to the Senate. Those people will not be representing Togolese or Ghanaians. They will be representing Nigerians. If Peter Gregory Obi wins the presidency and becomes the president of Nigeria, they wouldn't dare to go against the will of the Nigerian people. And if they do, we'll be on the streets marching. And I assure you, if the president is doing the will of the people and we are on the street marching, the Senate president cannot order policemen to shoot us. So the powers of the Nigerian presidency should never be underestimated that they are dealing with a lame duck president in a desperate gambit to redeem. The money is more or less like wounded soldier. You might imagine all those billions rendered useless. You know, when they don't shoot soldiers for them, they be dead soldiers. So you can see the desperation. People are, they are turning, they are issuing draconian edict and dictat. Mm. They will ban this, they will dissolve you of all, they will, come on. Agreed, sir. It's the Agreed, desperation. Sir. The Agreed. desperation is real. I, I mean, I, I know that if we let you, you can just go on and on and on and on about this. But let's take comments from our viewers. Diola. This one says, uh, my take on this topic is that the structures meant to drive leadership policies, namely the legislative and judiciary, including the civil service, can actually slow things down. Advently or inadvertently, truncate same. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Supposing Trump was here in Nigeria, he would have gotten away with his strongman posture to retain power. Here in Nigeria, a president will make a broadcast on policy direction and of, and, and of the governors will do his own to counter, even, will do his own to counter, even though Mr. President on his own was disobeying a Supreme Court order on the issue. Take our civil service. There are a lot of them sabotaging policies. What of legislative um, question, question, question? This is Austin from Delta. Thank you so much, Austin. <laughs> oh, you have a comment. Right, good evening, my dear beautiful sisters. And what are you saying? The sustainable governance structure. Uh, you beautiful ladies brought the right person to do justice and conduct a post-mortem on this topic. We cannot build a sustainable governance structure when we are lawless. We are easy to make laws but fail to implement it. Also, our country is based on 100% falsehood whereby a particular thing happens and you come out publicly and lie that that thing did not happen. A typical example is the Lekki toll gate massacre where people were killed and you said there was no killing and you even had the audacity to lie. Through this, you cannot build a sustainable governance structure. You cannot tell me to tighten up my belt while yours is still loose. My name is Daniel Ilo, your Ways regular fan. Thank you so much, Daniel. Like Daniel rightly said, we brought the right person to actually conduct a post mortem Absolutely. on this topic. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Daniel Farris. It was great having you on the show tonight. Yeah. Because, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, ladies, as well. Looking all beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Before we go, do ensure you follow us on Instagram at Way Show Africa. You can also interact with us further, drop a comment, and most importantly, follow all our social media engagement. And remember to like, share, comment, and invite your friends and family to watch us and follow us. If you missed today's quotes here it is again today i always believe that ultimately if people are paying attention then we get good government and good leadership and when we get lazy as a democracy and civically start taking shortcuts then it results in bad government and politics this is by barack obama see you again tomorrow at 8 p.m as we bring another great conversation to your screen